Awesome. Alex, thanks so much for jumping on. I'm really excited to dive into today's discussion. As many of our listeners know, we don't do a ton of guest interviews here, but it really, you know, going through some of your content, meeting you in person, getting awareness of what you're really about. One of the things that I've really seen stand out for you is that you really stand towards this awareness of energy management and kind of personal care as a business owner and as a busy professional. Why is that so important? Why is that such a problem now? Well, Ollie, first, thanks for having me, man. I, I know you don't do a lot of interviews. I'm honored. And I just want you to know that I've listened to, uh, like I was telling you, episodes of your podcast, and there is just a tremendous amount of alignment with the two of us. And I love your perspective and what you put out. Um, so for me, you know, I've, I've, I've been coaching, consulting, and owning businesses for over 30 years. I'm 51. I started when I was in my teens. And I've had team members for that period of time, too. And... What I share with entrepreneurs is that self-care is a gateway drug to success. And mm -hmm. what the entrepreneurial world says is you should destroy yourself to create success. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I'm constantly, you know, holding back the stream of all these influencers and thought leaders and people who talk about things like get up in the morning, grab a cup of coffee, go straight to work, don't get up until everything's done. And, you know, that sounds like a motivational talk but what it really is is justifying our challenging behaviors it's justification for the things that we shouldn't be doing because when you look at us as entrepreneurs you know i believe we are evolutionary hunters we are the, I, I wrote the book the entrepreneurial personality type and i define our personality type as physiologically sensitive momentum-based beings that are highly reactive to constraint and when i talk about that physiological sensitivity you know I fully believe for people like us, we feel the world around us. When we have a reaction to something, it's in our body first and our mind interprets it. There are people that I've asked, when you have a reaction to something, where do you feel it? And they say, in my mind, it's never an entrepreneur. We are physiologically sensitive. And, and the more we tune this instrument called our body, the more that we can trust our physiology, the more we can trust our gut, the more we can feel what we need to do in the world around us. And I think that most of the messaging we get in the entrepreneurial world is actually destructive to us creating not just the business we want, but the life we want. You know, 100% of entrepreneurs that I've ever talked to in some way or another, part of their reason for getting into entrepreneurship was some level of freedom. I joke around that as entrepreneurs, we give up the nine to five so we can have a, you know, seven to 10. And I don't mean in the morning, you know, and we get to this place where, where, we are almost willing to sacrifice everything to create success. But if we slow down that statement, we'll realize that sacrificing everything is actually the opposite of success. Yeah, I feel that being able to see a problem, see an area that we need to dive into and that visceral reaction of I need to put my whole body into this and it becomes so easy to just go full throttle and not apply the brake pedal. And I see two personalities there right there's the 110 percent or nothing which we see a lot that really start to burn themselves out and then we find this 80 20 aspect which is not as sexy but an ability to explore the ability to kind of feel good at 80 percent so i guess from my side from a reactivity aspect that's one where i see the full visceral i want to do this with all i've got is not the bad thing but the ability to apply a brake pedal or to know what parts reactive what's productive how do we break that down if, you, if for you you notice you're getting reactive or it's starting to go beyond the realms of i'm burning other bridges where do you break that down where do you start mm. i think it's i think it's hard to just in the moment say i'm going to stop this let me explain why you know, I, I, I've obsessed over entrepreneurial success and I've done a tremendous amount of research, not just in business. I think, you know, you start, you read enough business books and you read enough business theory and a business logic and, and there's a lot of repetition and a lot of reinforcement. But if you want to actually create human success, you have to stop, step out of the world of business. So I've done extensive research in psychology and social behavior and social conditioning and who we are as human beings and in a lot of research around trauma. You know, there is a consistency in my clientele over the past 30 years that there is significant unprocessed trauma. And what I believe happens to us as entrepreneurial personality types, and I always qualify that, I don't work with the whole world. I work with entrepreneurs. So I feel like I have a high level of expertise in our personality type, not everybody else. So I just wanna, I wanna make sure everybody understands that. But for people like us, what I believe happens is we are destined to recreate the energetic of our childhood as adults until we process our childhood trauma so we don't feel like we need it anymore. 
And, you know, right before I got in this podcast with you, I was on a delivery call with probably 60, 70 of our members. And we had this conversation because one of the members asked, you know, he said, no matter how much I do, no matter how much I achieve, no matter how much I accomplish, I still feel like I have to do more. And, you know, I, I'll start a business, it'll be doing really well, and then it'll get boring, I'll get complacent, then I go start another business, then I go start something else. And it's like this, this um, restlessness, this restless agitation that we always have to be doing something. And, you know, I told him that, you know, I think that that behavior could very highly likely come from the belief that you're not enough. And the belief that we're not enough comes from childhood when that belief was imposed on us. It's a core wound that we acquired in childhood where we truly believe we're not enough. And so we're constantly trying to do more, trying to be more and trying to create more stimulation around us. And oftentimes as entrepreneurs, unfortunately, what happens is that stimulation looks like creating a lot of chaos. You know, I, I always tell entrepreneurs, if you're always putting out fires, chances are you're the arsonist mm -hmm. and you're creating those fires. And so the more we regulate our nervous system, the more we are willing to take care of ourselves, the more we're willing to take ourselves offline for periods of time, like going on a walk or spending some time in neutral, those practices give us leverage everywhere else. On that same token, if we're in that place of constantly working every day, all day, that practice takes away leverage everywhere else. And so what I you know, work with entrepreneurs on in, in our company, Simple Operations, is operational systems for the business. Once they get those installed, we are all about optimization, health, and having the right habits in your life. Because if you have self-awareness, you'll start to create positive habits. Positive habits actually create a level of self-acceptance, and self-acceptance creates uh, or more positive habits that those doing more of those positive habits creates self-appreciation. If you have self-appreciation, you get to this place where you create consistency and consistency in any daily habit that's constructive, that's moving you forward, that's doing the right things for you. That's where transformation comes from. As entrepreneurs, we all want to believe transformation happens like a lightning bolt and transformation actually happens through the application of constructive processes of constructive habits through our lives and you know you're you're in the fitness business there is no such thing as a one day transformation in the fitness business this is there in fact the transformation that is created in the fitness business is over a period of time through following habits and through through exactly what i'm talking about and if we're willing to do those things that's how we really elevate and change as entrepreneurs it, if we if we stay in the 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 river of challenging information that's available in the entrepreneurial world today, chances are you're going to be in a place of being stressed out and burned out, and cortisol's all over the place, and your adrenals fatigued, and having hormone issues and thyroid issues and everything else. When we're when we're optimized and we're leveraged, that's when we really change the world in a way that creates success for us. Yeah, absolutely, and I see this every single week. You've got talking to a bloke recently, right? When when sales are down and business is slow, we're reactive and we're stressed. When sales are up and, and things are going fast, we're, we're reactive and we're stressed. <laughs> and it's this pattern that we start to see that it's like, well, you're in the middle creating fires. We don't have systems in place. And even when we do, we step in and break them anyway. And yeah. in that process, I start to see a level of awareness, as you said, being the cornerstone to both the business improving, but also your own personal health. And this transitionary period that I'm going through with quite a few clients at the moment right now that are trying to actually either exit a company or create this new level of management, create the space where they're no longer the bottleneck in that business. And what's creating that bottleneck is not the lack of business acumen, but more this awareness of managing their own central nervous system or ability to just pop in and break things yeah. there and then. So I want to look at this more from, I guess, the prompts around the self-awareness first, because we can go habits, we can go central nervous system. I really want to go there. But the first part of this, and fundamentally, it comes back down to self-awareness of noticing this stuff happening. And without having you and I, you know, showing that to them uh, quite clearly on a call, what are we looking for? Or what do you ask someone or a listener to look at if this recurring theme is coming through? So it, when, when, when you say recurring theme, if there's this recurring theme of creating stress and creating challenges, that's, that's the recurring theme. Yeah. You know, um, 
we we run everything through a framework or through a process, Ollie. And when we're working with a new client who's in that place of overstimulation and reactivity and has too many things going on, for us, it's really about helping them get clear on what they need to do, on, on what they really want. And I think there's this massive challenge with most of the discovery processes in the entrepreneurial world that they start with, where are you now and where do you want to go? And we're different. We actually start with where are you now and what can we leave behind so you can go where you want to go. Mm. And so when we start working with somebody who's in this place of hyper reactivity or triggerability or not really grounded, not, not feeling like they're so overwhelmed, they can't make the right decisions. The first one thing we talk about is how do we lower the pressure and noise in your life? Here's what happens to us as entrepreneurs, Ollie. See if this, I, I know you work with a lot of entrepreneurs, so I'm, I'm near certain this is going to land for you. What happens to us as entrepreneurs is we get to this place where if pressure and noise goes up high enough in our lives, all the abilities that make us great, all the things that make us capable, all the things that make us look like we can do everything reverse and make us look like we're challenged and disordered and disabled and we need a diagnosis and a prescription like that that absolutely happens and when we start working with an entrepreneur the first thing we do is we talk about what are you no longer going to do but here's what i want you to understand if you are doing too much it's typically because there's conditioning there from running a business see starting a business you have to do everything. That's the only way it's successful. I've never met anyone who's like, oh, I started a business and everybody did everything else for me because there's no team there at the inception. Mm -hmm. And so that conditioning of I did everything and I created success holds us in conditioning of in order to create success, I must do everything. And so we talk through that awareness and just having the awareness of I really do kind of feel like success means I have to do everything. And white space on my calendar means I'm failing. And if I'm not doing something every minute of the day, I'm not productive. Those are false beliefs that will destroy us as entrepreneurs because our goal should be to do as little as possible. Our goal should be to do, to create as much white space as possible. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs don't like to hear this, but the more important you are to your business, the less valuable it is. The more you do for your business, the more at risk it is. And so you want to be the least important person on the team. That doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't happen from a Monday to Tuesday or, you know, Monday to Friday either. It's, it's a long-term process that if you rise, use the right systems and structure, you can permanently delegate, put people in place to do what you're doing, take your time from tactical to strategic, and then spend less time in the business so you're creating a more valuable asset. But I think so often for us as entrepreneurs, we are that person who feels like if it's going to be done right, we have to do it ourselves. We're doing too much. We're, we're taking on too much. We're afraid to let go. And as long as we stay in that place, we're going to stay in that place of reactivity. Yeah, that's brilliant. I want to go down the route of your systems and delegation aspect as well, but I want to circle back to one key point there, which is this is a muscle that you can build, right? We start in the space of putting our finger in every pie and being involved in all the opportunities, doing all the stuff. And we have to relearn that skill over time if we're going to be effective rather than just hopping from opportunity to opportunity. But in that, there's a space of, you know, ongoing, I'm assuming just like me, that's a muscle that needs to be continually built, right? If we build the muscle work, we feel safe when working. When we build the muscle of joy, we feel, we feel safe and we're able to enjoy joy again. And I've asked this in hundreds of rooms, Alex, where or rooms with hundreds in them, where I've asked, you know, how do you find joy to business owners that have been in business five, 10, 20 years? And they all look at me like a deer in headlights. Being yeah. able to anchor that space of practices that allow you to tune back in to actually feel and appreciate space. What are some practices that you put in place to tune in for yourself so that the reactivity that is constantly pulling us in business is now reversed with some practice that allows us to feel and enjoy space? Yeah, so I'm, I'm obsessed with practices and habits, Ollie. You know, um, when I was younger, and, and even recently, I, I've had the privilege of working with like literally some of the most successful people on the planet. Um, when I was a consultant in my 20s, I worked with the richest guy in Latin America who ran uh, Sanborns and a lot of the stores down there, Carlos Slim. Uh, I had the opportunity to work closely with Dave Linegar, who ran uh, who did run Remax up until he retired um, in, in the consumer electronics business. I, I was around, you know, more than one billionaire, billionaire with a B. Like these are people who move the world around like puzzle pieces. 
And being the type of person that I am, I would always ask like, what, what created success for you? Or like, what would you tell me? Or, you know, whatever situation I was in, I was always trying to extract, how did they get there? And Ollie, so often the answer came back. It's what you do every day. And it's your personal habits. I remember asking this guy, Howard Johnson, who ran a company called Targus. And prior to that, he ran Aprika Strollers. He took Targus from, in the time I knew him, from 20 million to over a billion. And Howard and I were on sales calls one day and we had time in between meetings. And I asked him like, Howard, what would you, you know, what, what would you say is the most important thing to creating the type of success you have? And he said, it's the personal decisions you make. I'm like, what do you mean? This was before I was married. And he said, well, it's who you marry. It's who you hang out with. It's how you treat your body. It's, it's what you do every day for yourself. It's how bad you burn yourself out. Do you make yourself sick? Like that is what's going to create success over time. And I feel so fortunate to have been given that advice because after Howard told me that, I started really paying attention when I was around successful people. And Ollie, in, in the lives of successful people, there are like systems to lower noise. There's people there, there's structure there. Like they don't experience the type of stuff we do. I always tell people the more successful someone is, the less they're willing to tolerate. And so for me, daily habits are crucial. I use our momentum planner system, which is a, a product that we use in our membership is a product that we sell. And each morning I write down at least three things that I'm grateful for, three things where I won the day before, like what, it, where did I win? Because as entrepreneurs, we never celebrate and we don't experience pride. When you say, when I ask an entrepreneur, what are you proud of? A lot of times I'll get either their marriage or their kid, but it's like, that's just the answer that they're giving because they think it's the right answer. We don't really celebrate. We don't experience pride. We don't recognize success. There is scientific proof that if we recognize success and we draw attention to it, we draw more to us. You know, uh, Wayne Dyer, one of my all time heroes who changed my life so many different times, Wayne used to say, what you focus on expands. And what most entrepreneurs do is focus on their to-do list and ignore every place where they're doing well. You know what happens? They do less things that are really great and their to-do list grows like crazy. And what I do every morning is I focus on where did I win the day before? What am I grateful for? I, I, I write out a clear intention for the day. I select the top three things I'm going to do. And then I make notes on where I was uncomfortable the day before. Now, this is not to expand focus, but to create awareness so I know where I was uncomfortable because we're eternal optimists and I want this question to prompt me to lower noise in my life. And so in every morning when I'm recognizing gratitude, when I'm looking at where I won, where I'm recognizing where there was noise, I'm reticularly activating my system to be aware of where can I win more? Where can I be more grateful? Where can I eliminate pressure and noise? And, you know, there's a lot of other practices I have, but this is probably the most foundational and the most important to keep me going on a daily basis. Yeah, that's fantastic. We see that come through a ton is, are we giving ourselves some version of a pat on the back for the yeah. things that we're doing? And I've got, uh, Alex, I've got a photo on stage winning, you know, the category, the open division and in two different divisions entirely on the, on a bodybuilding stage and complete face, just like job done next thing. Right. And it just completely destroys that ability to explore like, well, like that was really fun. Like I enjoyed this. I, I, I feel proud of myself. There's, there's that space to just sit in that for a moment. I didn't even give myself one second on stage until six months later, I'd broken my body through a motorbike crash and all these things had happened. And I was like, back then, like this, the pursuit of it, it wasn't the goal. And I, I knew that it wasn't getting up on stage and getting a medal, but the pursuit of that goal, that little nudge that you have in your book to be able to say what came through yesterday am i proud of just allows you to continue smelling the roses i guess along the journey because as you said as entrepreneurs as business owners there's a level of pursuit that is enjoyable and i think being able to allow yourself to realize that that is a fun process rather than the next thing really allows you to kind of break down success as as that journey as that pursuit rather than some end destination that we we can't turn off as you as you say as well so yeah you, totally, Ollie. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Is it okay if I share one thing? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So it's funny that you bring up that uh, on the bodybuilding stage. You know, when I look at us as entrepreneur, entrepreneurial personality types, to me, that the identity is really evolutionary hunter. We are that small percentage of the population that 10,000 years ago would have gotten up in the morning. You and I would have gathered some sticks and stones with the rest of the people in the tribe who were like us, not like everybody else, and gone out and killed something and keep the human tribe alive. And I think that 
when we have an awareness that this is what's been epigenetically programmed, this is what has been um, maybe maybe through divine intelligence has been programmed into us that we are those evolutionary hunters. We have an understanding that as we approach a goal, it loses importance to us. You know, I think for, for most of my life, as soon as I was going to cross a threshold, I didn't care anymore. Mm. And I think part of that is because it's a survival mechanism that as soon as we kill something, our mentality says you need to go do it again. It's not, not enough. You need to go do it again. Keep the tribe alive. Keep the tribe alive. Make sure the tribe has food. But here's what we know now. If we're willing to slow things down and spend a moment in pride and celebration and gratitude and actually feel that energy in our body, we become energetically attuned to create more pride, celebration, and gratitude. And when I have worked through this myself and started, God, man, it's so hard for me to feel pride. It comes from my childhood. It's totally trauma. It's core wounds that I have. It's so hard to feel pride. But when I can get to the place where I've lowered the noise enough and I accomplished something that really means something to me because it was something that I planned out and I've pursued and I get through that accomplishment today, I can actually celebrate and feel pride and, um, and be grateful for what just happened. And Ollie, that to me is the catalyst for the next time it happens and the next time it happens and the next time it happens and the increasing levels of success that I have in my, my life now that I don't feel like I'm grasping and holding and like trying to keep it together and panic that it's all going to fall apart. Just things show up in my life and, and success is there because I have like literally turned myself into a magnet of attracting that into my life. And the only way you do that is by self-acknowledgement and self-recognition. Yep. And that ability to see that that's built into your genetic code of how you how you pursue things is just like any other genetic condition. You know that there's a predisposition to go a little bit hard for a little bit too long and burn things out, right? Yeah. It's your ability to then further anchor why important, how important those non-negotiables are in your day to create space, to rebuild that joy muscle, to allow yourself to smell the roses along the way. There's a, there's a phrase we use a lot inside our space, which is the man that can afford the beach house is usually the one that can't enjoy it. Right. And it's because we build that work muscle, we build that pursuit, and then we don't feel safe unless there's that that pursuit there. And as soon as the one thing's done, we're on to the next one. And creating that space is a huge part. Now, for me personally, this shift from simply constantly pursuit is my only way of feeling like I'm moving forward to now creating that space did also become with allowing my partner in, now wife, being able to have that discussion of are we growing together? Are we really breaking through these barriers and, and being able to enjoy that space without it being what's the next thing. Now, you've obviously gone through huge shifts and adjustments lifestyle-wise with your wife as well. So of the practices you have personally, how much of that do you let, let in with her? Is it the same process or a completely different structure that you have a cadence of communication there as you grow? So our company teaches three systems that we learned ourselves and that we put together ourselves to improve our lives. We have what we call the personal operating system, the relationship operating system, and the business operating system. The majority of our clients are in the business operating system and in that high ticket membership, but they get the relationship and the personal as, as part of it. And in the relationship operating system, we solve the biggest issues that marriages have. Dude, check out this statistic, Holly. The average couple only has 33 minutes a week of face-to-face -face conversation. 33 minutes. It blows me away. That's like, that's literally passing in the hallway and, and cumulative time, 33 minutes of face-to-face -face conversation. And so one of the, the biggest reasons for divorce is lack of communication and lack of sex and fighting around money. And so we have a structure where Katie does her personal planning, I do my personal planning, and we come together for alignment every morning. And every morning I share with her and she shares with me, where, what was she grateful for? Where did she win? That gives me an understanding of, of what's going on for her. She shares her intention for the day. I do the same thing. She shares where she was uncomfortable. I do the same thing. Then we share the top three so that we, there's a level of understanding and alignment of what each of us has going on. That probably takes 15 or 20 minutes which means in two days, we're already beating the average couple just in our morning alignment, right? And the last thing that we share is each morning, I write down three things that I really appreciate about Katie. Like this morning, I wrote down, she's the love of my life, she's sexy, and she's committed to momentum and improvement. And so every morning we share that with each other. 
intimacy is created through time and through sharing and through opening yourself up to the person that you're sitting across from. And in most marriages, what happens, especially with that 33 minutes a week, we have a relationship that is held together by threads of communication. And what it really should be is we should be making, reinforcing that relationship over everything else in our lives. I often share with entrepreneurs, if, you, if you're a married entrepreneur, you wanna be successful, there's only two rules. Treat your marriage as it's most important. And then number two is go back to rule number one. Because what happens far too often in the entrepreneurial world is we sacrifice our marriage for success, which Jesus, if there's anything in this the opposite of success, it's that. And what we don't recognize and realize that if we're willing to create intimacy with our partner, it can be one of the most stabilizing things in our lives for our central nervous system. Most of us as kids did not grow up with secure attachment. We had parents that, that tried their best, most of us, um, but they didn't create a secure attachment. They didn't create nervous system regulation for us. And so when we're in a partnership, in a marriage or in a relationship where we create secure attachment and we have the time for intimacy and we share openly with each other and we create vulnerability, that is a supercharger for central nervous system regulation. And so we put a ton of time into it, Ollie. That's, that's like the basic practice we have. And then on a monthly basis, we also go through finances and major decisions. It's like how, and we talk about sex. And Katie and I, at any given time, we are reading a book about sex together, or we're in a class, a sex class, or in you know some type of education, because if the top three things that destroy marriages are finances, communication, and sex, we reinforce the crap out of those three things. And it's interesting, the same way those things destroy marriages, you put focus into them, it will reinforce and make yours an incredibly strong marriage. Yeah, things get better when you pay attention, right? That's a brilliant way of, of approaching it. And even what I was gonna ask next here, Alex, was, you know, the the balance in regards to when you manage that central nervous system, you're able to have these discussions, but in a lot of ways, you've actually flipped that on its head. You have these discussions, you are able to go deeper, you're more engaged, and in doing so, you actually improve that nervous system uh, function and, and ability to create space. Yeah, it goes both ways. It absolutely, it cuts bo in both directions. You know, sometimes <laughs> in a marriage, you have a very vulnerable, dysregulating conversation. But that vulnerable, dysregulating conversation opens the opportunity for regulation. And I think so often for us in, in relationships and business and in our lives, we do a lot of, you know, a lot of, of protecting against vulnerability or protecting against high levels of emotion. And when we allow for vulnerability and emotion and we allow that to create the opening for a discussion rather than the closing for a discussion, man, it can change everything for us. I, I tell anybody who will listen that marrying Katie was by far the best decision I ever made. My parents gave me life. She showed me how to create a life. And the time and energy that I put into my marriage by far has had the highest return on investment in time of anything I've ever done. Yeah. And this is a beautiful way to think of how your mind works and what, how we approach this because we're we're anchoring in those steps for us to work personally. We're then having that communication pathway with our relationships to make sure we're on the same wavelength. And then we're allowing that to create a channel of focus around what grows, what builds. Because if there's anything that's going to, you know, we had an amazing relationship coach in with our members recently. And I just like the systematizing of it, which is love is not a feeling, but a process and being able to pour that energy into areas that you want to feel get better. It just was like, cool, just like everything else. If I can lead myself, I can lead others. If I can lead myself, this thing gets better. And it just becomes a really nice balance between I'm in ownership of what I can do, but it's not a, a pressure thing around having to do more. If anything, it's less, but creates space for these conversations. And for all those things that you're trying to pursue externally, they're not going to give you that same satisfaction of just having that hard discussion. And leading into that, whether it's in business, in relationships, I'm sure you see that every day, is the ability to have hard discussions really is that quality of life. Yeah. Yeah, no question. And when you're willing to do that, so the reason that Katie and I have a process for our business and a separate process for our relationship is that one of the things that's so important for us as entrepreneurs, this is, this is Katie, not me. She always shares this. She was the first one to say it. As entrepreneurs, we need to separate the momentum in our marriage from the momentum in our business. Because what happens so often is the momentum in our business drives our feeling about everything else. 
and businesses are cyclical, markets are cyclical, they go up and down, things change, the iOS changes, advertising changes, platform changes. If we are always regulating our nervous system through business success, we're going to have major challenges. But if we're willing to separate the momentum that we feel in our partnership from the momentum that we feel in the business, that's where we can actually have the marriage be the foundation from which we do everything else. The relationship be the foundation from which we do everything else. And it takes, you know, it takes some effort, but if you're willing to do that, it, again, it creates such a massive amount of leverage and central nervous system regulation and energy and um, stamina in our lives when we feel like we have a secure attachment. And so I think it's, it's a place where every entrepreneur should focus. Absolutely. And I love we've gone this way because we've focused on the personal uh, systems or at least anchors first. We've then applied that to our relationships, create this its own entity of really energy and focus and, and really that continual presence to then apply a completely different channel towards a business, which is ultimately separate. And when we attach too much to that business of the ebbs and flows, that usually goes the other way, right? Business is down so the, the family blows up and there's something that really starts to become a yeah, it's the wrong way around. So when we now have that in place, that fundamentally becomes a really nice spot to get an awareness, I guess, of where some of these patterns and the recognition of creating fires inside business come through. Now, delegation and the ability to employ others in, in order to delegate tasks and your continual need to feel like you're over the whole thing versus, as you said before, getting to a point where you actually feel like the least important person in the room because you've got an amazing team of A players well, there's a whole lot of personal growth required there, right? And in the process of trying to create freedom, there's actually a removal of control required. So I don't even know where I want to start here, Alex, but that space is obviously your world. Where do we start there if we're trying to actually remove levels of control? So I think that the biggest issue in the entrepreneurial world today is that somewhere over 95% of entrepreneurs are running their business through personality management. And Ollie, I'll break down what that means. So personality management is when as entrepreneurs, we are the central hub of the business. Um, you know, the, the not so flattering descriptor I have for that is monkey in the middle. Mm -hmm. And if you intro, if you imagine us as entrepreneurs being the dot in the middle of all the people in the business where we are overtaxed, we're doing too much, we're totally overwhelmed, we don't really have the help or support that we need. Like that is that place of pers personality management. It's like, it's all transactional. It's telling people what to do, checking that it got done, telling them what to do again, checking that it got done, telling them what to do again. I say that over and over just to make you feel it. Like I, when I say that, I feel it. It feels bad in my body. It feels constraint in my body. And that place of personality management, most of us are there because nobody's shown us a, a better way. Nobody's told us that there's a better way. When What we do with entrepreneurs is we take them from personality transactional management to process-based transformational leadership. And here's what process-based leadership is. When you go from personality to process, there's a process for planning in the business and understanding what to do. There's a process for creating the outcomes. There's a process for execution. There's a process that the entire team can rely on as the central framework to run the business. When that happens, you are no longer that process. In the absence of an operating system to run the business, you are the operating system. When we put an operating system in the business, you can step away and manage it without having to be that personality who's driving day-to-day -day growth. And what happens when you have process-based leadership you have clear outcomes because there's a planning system, an execution system. People in the business understand what the company is doing, what each department's doing, what each person's doing, and what each project needs. And when you have that clarity of clear outcomes, you don't have to be telling people what to do. You just support them and coach them. Every visionary I've ever met is an incredible coach and supporter and advocate and cheerleader and, and problem solver. And so instead of staying in the place of, hey, did you do this? And hey, you made a mistake and what's happening? We show people what we really want done, and then we step in and say, let me support you, let me help you, let me go through this decision-making process with you. And when we have clear outcomes and we coach success, we get massively leveraged results and we get our lives back. And so the issue for most people is that personality is how we will instinctively run a business. When we're willing to not instinctively, but purposefully and deliberately put an operating system in the business, that's when we can step out and the business can truly grow. Yeah, I feel that too. You know, the ability to give someone a task and a process 
without feeling like there's a stressful emotion attached to like, this is how it needs to be done, right? Rather than uh, follow this, go through the process, let me know any questions and we can start with that. And you know what done looks like now. And it's just this communication of separating those two. I, I definitely feel that. So, you know, we see this a lot with uh, some clients in more of a brick and mortar space where we're seeing an office manager or an assistant that's trying to, you know, ultimately they feel that they're monkeying the middle. They've now employed someone to kind of throw everything at them. And now it's a case of creating some process there. And I'm sure you see that a ton too, right? Like I need someone to just fix this mess in the middle. Here's someone to do it. What are some steps that if we either need to reverse engineer and start the whole process again, or if they're already in that spot, you know, one, two, and three, what are some initial steps we start with? How do we break that down? Where do we look first? As far as like bringing somebody in to help you? Yeah. Okay. So we have a process for that as well, Ali. I think if you're an entrepreneur who doesn't have help, who doesn't have somebody in the business right now, the thing that we want to do is start with data. We want to understand where are we going to get you your time back? And uh, I don't know of another way to do this. If there was an easier way to do it, I would share it. But what we suggest is that you do a time study. And a time study is a process where for two weeks, you carry around sheets of paper. And I had some of them here. I don't, they're not on my desk right now, but I was just, I just did it this quarter. You carry sheets of paper around and you write down everything you're doing in 15 minute increments. If it sounds like it's not fun, it's because it's not. <laughs> it's actually, it's actually somewhat stressful. And, um, but here's what happens. Like every time I do a time study, I, I have to sneak it up on myself. Like I print the stuff, I put it on my desk. And if, if like, I don't remind myself to do it, I will avoid it. But here's what happens within the first two or three days, I'm already seeing opportunity for efficiency. I'm way more productive because there's no way I'm writing down. I was scrolling on Facebook for an hour. Not that that normally happens, but I'm a lot more deliberate with my time. And at the end of two weeks, I have this magical thing called data. And the, the majority of people have zero data on their time other than the calendar. And we all know the calendar lies. It's only going to tell you what you planned on doing. It's not going to tell you what happened. And so when we have this two weeks of data, we go through it with an entrepreneur and we have them mark what's, there's a lot of different categories we have, but the two main categories, like we talk about self-care and exercise and meals and time with family and time with community. But the two major categories for entrepreneurs are work that you do that's tactical and work that you do that's strategic. Those are by far the largest categories. And when we first go through a time study with most people, they're spending 50 to 75% of their time on tactical activities, just making sure the business is moving forward. And they're working 40 to 60 hours a week. Ollie, that's 1,000 to 2,250 hours a year. And I mean, you're punched out before you even started. And so when, once we get that data and we see how much time is tactical and how much is strategic, we go to a second step and we take all of those tactical items and we ask which, which of these could somebody else do? And then once we understand what that looks like, we create that job description. We literally take everything that was on time study, put it on a job description and go out and find somebody who all of that can be delegated to. And this is a more involved process than just writing a job description and throwing it up on an employment board. But here's what happens. If you go through the process of the time study and you identify exactly where you're spending your time and you bring in somebody and delegate those things to them, you will almost immediately have time back in your day. And that's really the goal of bringing somebody into a business. It's getting your time back, getting your focus back, getting your energy back and being able to show up for the business in the best way you can. And so we, we are deliberate about how we do this with people because hiring and asking for help are two of the hardest things we do as entrepreneurs. I would put asking for help as the hardest hiring is right there behind it. And if you go out and hire someone and it fails, you will be conditioned to never do it again. I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs I've talked to. They're solopreneurs and I'll say, why don't you have a team? Oh, I hired a friend of mine eight years ago. It was horrible. Yeah. Eight years ago. Like, can you imagine how, like, how unkind are you being to yourself? Can you imagine as a parent, if your baby got up and walked and fell down, you're like, shit, broken baby, let's get a new one. There's no way, you know, we are so much more caring with the people around us than we are with us Be because when we hire and it fails, psychologically it affects us. And so we go through a process so that the likelihood of success is extraordinarily high. And if for any reason there's not a success, you can pick the process right back up and go find the person you need. Yeah, I love this. Uh, and, you know, with clients that have been working with us be beyond the sort of 12 month mark, right? It's a lot less about nutrition training. It's a lot more about where are you creating your own fires and that ability to break down some version of timestamp of optimizing towards two things, right? It's not just about the higher value or strategic aspects, but as you've just mentioned, that energy aspect attached to it. 
and I, I saw from my, I listened on one of your podcasts recently, those things that you really hate doing, like the billing or the accounting or the cleaning or whatever it might be, there's someone out there that actually loves that task and yeah. being able to now assign it to someone that here's your role based on all the things that drain my energy, but actually create yours. You've now not only just got your energy back, you've now doubled the capacity of the company in, in an area that both of you are great at. Yeah. Yeah. Ollie, I'm obsessed with it. It's funny because my wife and I talk about this. I'm like, I'm a delegation master. I, I, ne I wasn't it early in my life. I was the opposite. I was the hold on to everything. Don't let anybody do anything. My whole life was transactional. And sometime in like my mid thirties, I started delegating and really understood. I worked with a, a coach for a while and he showed me like how to, how to delegate in a way that it stayed delegated and how to delegate in a way that I didn't have insecurity. It was very much part of the process that I just shared with you. And if there's something I'm doing repeatedly, I move to delegate it. So I'll share a quick, funny story with you. My wife struggles with her closet. Um, it's like the messiest place in our house. And thank God we have two separate closets and I don't see hers because I'm, I'm like fanatic about having things organized and having things clean. And I like it all to be aligned like a retail store. And so a few nights ago, Katie came into my closet and she's like, you know, I come in here and it's so annoying. Your closet always looks perfect. Like, I don't even know where you find the time to do this. And I'm like, oh. I delegated this to Jackie, our house manager, four or five months ago. And Katie's like, what? I'm like, yeah, Kate, Jackie manages my closet. Like I used to do it, but now she does it. And so Jackie also does the air conditioning filters, light bulbs, like, you know, fire alarm batteries, all she changes my cold plunge. She cleans out the sauna. I don't do any of that stuff. And my goal always is if I'm doing something that does not feel fulfilling or exciting, how fast can I give it to somebody that wants to do it and is willing to do it? And Jackie, our house manager, actually grew up in an entrepreneurial family where she was kind of the house manager for her family and helped run the family business. She's doing the exact same thing here and she loves what she does. And she's excited to do that stuff. And, you know, I come in and she's like smiling. She's like, Hey, I, sw I you know, swapped out the cold plunge. We have to change the water every 90 days. She'll say, Hey, I did the cold plunge today. So it'll be all clean tomorrow. And she's smiling. And I always think in the back of my head, man, when I used to have to do that, I was not smiling. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I like, I do as much as I can to get that stuff out of my life. Cause like you said, energy management and and staying in a, a positive orientation and staying in a, a place where you're connected and aware is so valuable to me that I don't let mundane tasks get in the way. Yeah, I love this. So one last thing I want to ask is this is really great. I, I like going into this delegation, both from a tactical aspect, but more the emotional or trigger aspect that actually so, it gets in the way because so many guys know, yeah, this could happen. I know that I hired someone before and it didn't work. There's probably someone better out there, but, and there's that block. So my last question to you in the delegation space is, does it truly have to come from a place of pain? Because we see this where it's the the pain loop, right? We finally get to a point that it's bad enough that we finally challenge our beliefs and then bring someone in. Is there another way? And if there is, what is it? So um, probably eight or nine years ago, I would have told you, yes, it has to come from pain. Mm. Like um, I might have said something dramatic, like it almost has to come from loss and it has to come from from reputational damage or challenges in a business because that's that's you know that it, it like back then when i say eight or nine years let me qualify that maybe 10 years 10 or 12 years ago but in 2011 we started teaching the concepts that we teach today to people who were not in pain to people who were not business broken to people who like wanted to improve and wanted to understand more and here's what I found, Ollie, is if you have the right frameworks and instruction, that's step one. The second part is having support around this delegation, that's step two. I, I never thought I would say this, but man, step three is having the right community. Hmm. So we have this, this group, this community, and I'm part of several entrepreneurial communities. I'm very careful of what I join and, and where I go because I want the right culture. But we have this membership where members see other people delegating and they hear the stories of other people delegating and they hear, you know, this person brought in a personal chef. This person has a daily house cleaner. This person has two assistants, one for the business and one for their personal life, you know, and that sense of community and seeing the vision of what's possible, seeing other people do it is really the catalyst that I've seen for people delegating and, and, and causing pain, or sorry, delegating in a way that prevents the pain before it starts.
I think that that community part of it is so crucially important. I, I'm like, I'm having like weird body reactions right now because man, in my twenties, I used to be like, I don't need community. I can do this. You know, I, I don't need friends. I don't need anybody. I've got it. You know, I can do it all by myself. And man, now for the last 15 or 20 years, I would say on an annual basis, my belief in the importance of community has gone up to now. I think it is it, an entrepreneur. It's one of the most important things in our lives. The community that we're around, the influence we allow, the culture that we're part of, the example that we see in other people absolutely is life changing for us as entrepreneurs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the ability to raise the bar comes from an ability to surround, you, sound, surround yourself with people that are in that same space. And if you're seeing people that are at the same level or worse off than you making these tweaks and you're able to, in a way, it's kind of a, potentially it's comparison, but it's creating a space where it's showing opportunity to make some tweaks. And I think if you can see that, it's pretty fairly powerful to be like, there is likely a obstacle that you need to uncover to go through, but the pain doesn't necessarily have to be for you, be yours. And I think certainly men, <laughs> Uh, you touch the fire, you find out it's hot. Sometimes you have to, uh, but sometimes there's a space where uh, over time we learn and certainly as we get older, we've done it enough times that we've got the scars and bruises to know that, okay, there might be a smarter way here and that we're not Superman. We need to break this down and look at ways to create balance. And if we're in a spot where, you know, typically the people that are listening to this have probably already had 20 or so years in business and in that space where they actually are desperate to find a new way but the ability to channel it back to the fact that it's their ability or their opportunity to improve their internal dialogue, the ability to create space in that stress that they feel is just normal, and then be able to then walk through that path of actual action steps actually allows them to go a lot further because it's not just simply a an ingrained way of making things harder for ourselves. And I think that's really where we've gone today, Alex. Um, I've really, really enjoyed this. This has gone all the directions I wanted to go. We've gone through personal, we've gone through relationships, we've gone through business and, and the systems aspect behind it that just all tie together really nicely. The last question I always like to ask, which is more of a, it's a very generic, generic question, but because I get such great answers with guys like you that have a texture of mind that understand that this is a complex question and a simple question, uh, what does success look like to you now? Hmm. Man, it is so much different than it used to be. Um, you know, Ali, success for me used to be an unlimited amount of money. And when I say unlimited amount of money, when I had, when success was hundred thousand dollars a year, I didn't even realize I had hit it. When success was a half million dollars a year, I blew right through it. And, and like, it wasn't enough when success was a million dollars a year, it, I hit it and I'm like, oh, there's so much more here. When we hit our first million dollar net profit month, I'm like, oh, we can go further than this. And it was like, there was, there was no, there was no limit to like what I wanted. I just wanted to keep consuming and, and gaining and growing for no reason. You know what grows for no reason? Cancer. Mm. You no, know? that's what grows for no reason. And what I realized from creating a, a you know, a, a very respectable level of success for myself is that the difference between making a half a million dollars a year and a million dollars a year wasn't that much. And the difference between making a million and three really wasn't that much. And the difference between three and six really wasn't that much. I had really the same type of life. I just had a higher level of security. So in my life today, I've created a massive amount of financial security and success today for me looks like central nervous system regulation. It looks like feeling present and aware on a daily basis, being radically healthy, like optimized top 1%. Like for me, I must be in the top 1% or I don't feel like I'm succeeding because I want statistics on my side and in the categories where I can get comparative data, I'm in the top 1%. And success looks like being able to spend time with my kids and regulate their nervous systems and understand who they are and grow, like be there while they're growing up and spending a ton of time with my wife. And here's the irony by focusing on those things, more financial success and abundance shows up in my life than when I was killing myself and doing nothing and 300 pounds and the most likely case of a heart attack for my doctor. And so, you know, I don't, I don't talk about balance much because I think balance for me kind of has this picture of somebody falling off a tightrope, but for me, it's more integration. You know, when I can integrate what I have to do in the day 
for my business or what I want to do in the day for my business and what I do in the day to take care of myself and time with my daughters and time with my wife, that's true success. And I feel that success. It's not some nebulous thing that I just keep chasing a big outcome and a big number on a scoreboard that never ends. It's actually real and it's in the present and it's now. Like I feel good now. And that to me is such a shift from where I used to be. Because Ollie, I was that, I was just like you, getting the award on stage, literally walking off stage. And I mean, dude, I once won an award at a business conference and I walked off stage, set it down and lost it because it meant that little to me. And today, when I experience success, I actually have the experience of success. It's not just checking the box, walking on stage because I had to. Yeah, beautiful answer, Alex. I knew you'd have a great one there. Thanks so much for jumping on, dude. The ability to articulate this deeper ingrained behavioral science of success, of nervous system regulation, of the patterns that we put in place that sabotage our own enjoyment along the way. You're awesome at it. You're world-class at it. I enjoyed our discussion so much. Where can people find more about you? Uh, where should we send them? Oh, Ollie, I just want you to know, coming from you, that means a lot, like a tremendous amount. I have a lot of respect for what you do and, and for what you put out in the world. So thank you. And, uh, to find out more about me, you can you can go to our podcast. So if you're a podcast listener, we have a, a podcast called Momentum for the Entrepreneurial Personality Type. We've published almost 900 episodes. We're still in the top like one half of 1% of podcasts worldwide. And so I'd love to have you as a listener. You can go to MomentumPodcast.com or just search Momentum for the Entrepreneurial Personality Type on any platform. And uh, if you're an entrepreneur and you're running a business, um, the best framework we have to determine where you are and what you should be focused on right now is a framework we call the billionaire code. It's the nine levels that you go through to get from zero to a hundred million dollars. It allows you to identify exactly what you are and what you should be consuming and focused on. You can go to billionairecode.com to check that out. Amazing. Thanks so much, Alex. Oh, Ollie, thank you. And, uh, if this goes well, maybe we can do it again sometime. I truly enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, absolutely, team. If anyone, uh, for everyone listening to this, let me know what you think. We obviously don't do many of these guest podcasts, but when this came up as not, not an opportunity I wanted to pass, uh, being able to explore experts in a space that very much tie into what we're trying to achieve uh, is super fun. I've learned a ton and uh, hopefully you have too.